Hi, I'm Gianmarie Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we take a repertoire piece, or a part of it, and we analyze it from a conductor's point of view. In this episode, we'll go through Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique, its groundbreaking music, its orchestration, and of course, we'll have some technical tips. As usual, you can jump through different sections of the video by clicking on the links present in the description below. Now, let's start! <laughs> Certainly Berlioz's most popular work, the Symphonie Fantastique, could be defined as the first psychedelic symphony. Written in 1830, so only three years after Beethoven's death and two after Schubert's, the Symphonie Fantastique is projected into the future in a way that had never happened before in the history of music. But what's the story behind it? In 1827, a then 23 years old actor Berlioz attended a performance of Shakespeare's Hamlet in Paris. The charismatic Irish actress Harriet Smithson was playing Ophelia. Berlioz was totally struck by her and wrote her an impassioned letter to which she never replied. Undeterred, he continued to bombard her with messages, but she left Paris without ever making contact with him. Berlioz wrote to a friend. You don't know what love is, whatever you may say. For you, it's not that rage, that fury, that delirium which takes possession of all one's faculties, which renders one capable of anything. The Symphony Fantastique is a programmatic symphony in five movements. It tells the story of an artist gifted with a lively imagination who has poisoned himself with opium in the depths of despair because of hopeless, unrequited love. Clearly autobiographical, as Brunstein put it, Berlioz tells it like it is. Now, there was an honest man. You take a trip, you wind up screaming at your own funeral. Harriet Smithson did not attend the premiere in 1830, but she heard the work in 1832 and realized Berlioz's genius and that she might have been the inspiration for it. The two finally met, and despite the fact that they weren't speaking the other's language, they married in 1833. However, their marriage became increasingly bitter. The obsession faded away, and they separated after seven years of unhappiness. In Berlioz's opium-altered mind, where the opium was most likely only his infatuation, Smithson had turned into a musical idea. But not just any musical idea, she became an obsessive, recurring idea, an idée fixe, or if you prefer, a leitmotiv. A leitmotiv that will be the glue of all five movements, wandering through them like a ghost, in different forms but always clearly recognizable. Now, as mentioned, the Symphony Fantastique tells a story. Each movement depicts an episode in the protagonist's life, a young musician, that is described by Berlioz in the program notes to the 1845 score. The first movement is titled Reverie Passion, Visions or Dreams and Passions, as Berlioz himself wrote. The author imagines that a young musician, afflicted by the sickness of spirit which a famous writer has called the vagueness of passions, the Bac de Passion, sees for the first time a woman who unites all the charms of the ideal person his imagination was dreaming of and falls desperately in love with her. By a strange anomaly, the beloved image never presents itself to the artist's mind without being associated with a musical idea, in which he recognizes a certain quality of passion, but endowed with the nobility and shyness which he credits to the objects of his love. This melodic image and its model keep haunting him ceaselessly like a double idée fix. This explains the constant recurrence in all movements of the symphony of the melody which launches the first allegro. The transitions from this state of dreaming melancholy, interrupted by occasional upsurges of aimless joy, to delirious passion, with its outbursts of fury and jealousy, its returns of tenderness, its tears, its religious consolation, all this forms the subject of the first movement. By the way, the famous writer was none other than François René de Chateaubriand. Now, as you've seen, Berlioz in 1845 takes his time to make sure that the audience understands his point. Interestingly, however, the notes that Berlioz himself writes again in 1855, so 10 years later, are much more concise and much more to the point. He remembers first the uneasiness of spirit, the indefinable passion, the melancholy, the aimless joy he felt even before seeing his beloved. Then, the explosive love she suddenly inspired in him, his delirious anguish, his fits of jealousy fury, his returns of tenderness and his religious consolations. 
but we're gonna have to wait five full minutes from the beginning of the symphony before we can hear the famous idee fix. And Berlioz opens with a slow introduction, which is also one of the most difficult tests for any conductor. Now keep in mind that this piece is a constant exchange of taking control, holding control and letting go between the conductors and the orchestra. And as a conductor you need to know exactly when and where you're needed and when you would be only getting in the way of the players. Generally speaking, keep it clean and simple. The first six parts, for example, can be conducted with your left hand only and you can save your right hand hand for the pizzicatas of the cellos and violas on bar 7. Keep going with the left hand and catch the pizzicata of the basses with right hand on bar 12. See, if you play this kind of game with your hand, so to speak, and you stay as still as possible, you're not going to disturb the music, you're actually going to help the player and help the music come through. The dreaminess and uneasiness is suddenly interrupted by a burst of enthusiasm. Which inevitably falls back into the melancholy of the beginning. Now this is an incredibly difficult section to conduct, especially for the tempo, which needs to go back to the tempo primo very gradually and seamlessly. In fact, Berlioz himself was aware of it and put a note in the score urging conductors to rehearse this passage again and again. The dream continues and we get to a weird part of it. It begins with a sort of a dance gesture in the second violins, followed by drops of rain in the first violins. The solo horns keep the momentum, but at one point their line turns into a sort of a hunting call. Perhaps we are in that weird dimension between sleep and awakeness, till somebody knocks at the door of our mind and the allegro begins. Knocking lasts only a few bars, and we are finally introduced to the ide fix. The idea starts by going up, full of enthusiasm and energy, but when it reaches the fourth grade of the scale, it falls back on itself. It gets more courage and tries again, starting from a lower point to reach a higher note. There's a feeble attempt to grow higher and higher, even by pushing the tempo at the animato. But inevitably, it falls back in its own frustrations. If we look at this phrase in its entirety, we'll see that Berlioz paints a chromatic scale from the dominant to the tonic, only to reverse it in these tired triplets that move back from the tonic to the dominant and then make everything collapse again. That is how the accompaniment of the strings, minus the first violins of course who play the melody with the flute, create a slippery ground. Along with the dynamic and tempo changes, this helps generating a sense of anxiety. The passions of the young musicians are pulling and pushing and can hardly be contained. Now before and after the exposition of the leitmotif, we have some fireworks. It's an ongoing battle of this pure musician struggling to keep dreaming and the anguish of his own passions. A struggle that is accentuated by the dynamic contrast and by the structure of the phrase. Berlioz didn't have much appeal for regular phrase structures in general, but here even less. He keeps bouncing between two bars and three bars phrases, which keeps the attention of the listener constantly on its toes, never being predictable. A shred of the leitmotif comes back in a question and answer bit, and we are at the end of the exposition with a marked repeat. 
Yes, the exposition. While this movement is not in a completely formal and classical sonata form, it gets close to it. We have a slow introduction, an exposition and the coda at the end. The development and the recapitulation are mixed together with the added bonus of some extra elements. The radical approach of Berlioz lies in the harmonic outline of this movement, building a long arch back to the home key. The development begins with the ide fix raging jealousy in the lower strings, sustained by the fire of the first and second violins, while the woodwinds sigh on. It all builds into a climax, which leaves room to even more anguish. The chromatic scale returns with waves of emotions underlined by the continuous changes of dynamics. It keeps growing and growing, bordering the line of insanity, and a full orchestra chord puts a stop to it. And we need three full bars of silence in order to regroup, only for the obsession to return haunting our dreams. Notice how the accompaniment we heard at first when the theme was presented the first time spins now off the second violins. It's reversed and bounces back and forth between the upper and the lower strings. And this could seem very well like the beginning of the recapitulation, but Berlioz changes course again. And we have more outbursts of rage, followed by lines of despair tailing one another. For a moment, we have the hope or delusion of a happy end, but the omnipresent idee fix builds up to a tumultuous climax. <laughs> this music makes your head spin. You feel like you're constantly pulled in different directions. It's, it's like being on a merry-go-round that got out of control. <laughs> Which is exactly what you need not do when you're conducting this piece. Once you initiate the fortissimo at rehearsal number 17, reduce the size of your stroke. It's incredibly difficult to be together here, so the less you move around, the more control you'll have over the orchestra and the easier you'll make it for them. The madness fades away, at least on the surface. We have a final fire and we go back to La La Land. The theme, Solitary, is presented once more by the first violins and the lid on this movement is closed by a religious pianissimo. A curiosity. Berlioz was a master orchestrator. He wrote a part in the symphony at first for a serpent and one for Ophicleide. The serpent is a bass wind instrument descended from the cornet, but it proved to be very difficult to use, so Berlioz quickly switched to two Ophiclades. Now, the Ophiclade is a brass instrument that looks like a cross between a bassoon and a saxophone with the mouthpiece similar to the one of the trombones. And the word Ophiclade in Greek literally means serpent with keys. Now, these days the Ophiclade is almost extinct and its line is usually played by the tuba. When it was first performed, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique was so new and so shockingly unconventional that it caused an uproar. Nobody had ever put in music something so personal, made even more explicit by the composer's program notes. He told a story with such vivid details that one could actually visualize all of them. And it is, as the title suggests, fantastic in every way. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below this video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and I will see you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will talk about the second movement of Rimsky-Korsakov Sherazad. Till then, bye bye. Ha! Okay, I don't think there's too many bloopers in this one. Well, maybe there are some. So only three years after Beethoven's death and two after Schubert's, uh, the Symphony Fantastic is projected into the dead lot because hopeless. I almost had it. Because once more, because the dog barked. <laughs>